Hi, it's the MLM for the Soul Channel. I do have a new topic for today. Before I begin, I just would like to say, may the words and expressions of my mouth and the thoughts and meditations of my heart find favor and acceptance before you, Hashem. This is the continuation of the Mesilas Yesharim, which is called the Way of the Upright of the Path of the Just by the Ramchal of Moshe Chaim Utsato. And this is from the Archgo Yaf edition, and this is what the Sefer looks like if you've never seen it. And I will have a link below to Archgo so you can check out all that they offer. And this is part number 75, and still the continuation of chapter 19, which is called The Elements of Hasidus, which is defined as piety. And uh, last time we were talking about honoring, different, there were th different things about honoring um, in the previous videos. You can check back on those or any of the other previous videos. This one is called honoring, the section on honoring the Torah. And I believe this one's going to be a little bit longer than the past one. Okay, so... Here goes. <laughs> if honoring, so honoring the Torah. If honoring anything associated with Hashem is a byproduct of fearing his exaltedness, then honoring his Torah, the embodiment of his will, is certainly a prime example of this. Okay, so now he says, also included in the fear of Hashem's exaltedness is honoring the Torah. And the commentary says, this includes honoring the actual physical books of the Torah, as well as honoring the subject material discussed therein, as Ramchal will soon explain. And then it says, see also Derech Hashem 425. Okay, now he continues, and those who study it. So you're fearing the exaltedness of the, and honoring the Torah and those who study it. We have explicitly learned about the importance of honoring the Torah. That's from Avos 4.6. Whoever honors the Torah is himself honored by people. And the sages of blessed memory says, said as an example of this in Sanhedrin 102b. Rabbi Yochanan said, on account of what good deed did the wicked king Ahav merit the monarchy for 22 years? So the answer is because he honored the Torah which was given with the 22 letters of the Aleph Beis. As it is stated in scripture, Malachim Aleph 20, he, meaning Ben Hadad, king of Aram, sent messengers to Ahav, king of Israel, into the city and said to him, Thus said Ben Hadad, Your silver and your gold are mine and your best women and children are mine. The king of Israel replied, saying, Just as you say, my lord the king, I and all I own are yours. The messengers returned to Ahab and said, At this time, tomorrow, I shall send my servants to you, and they will search your house and the houses of your servants, and it shall be that everything precious in your eyes they will place in their hands and take away. Okay? The sages explain in Sanhedrin 102b, that since Ahab had already agreed to surrender his woman and children, when Ben Hadad additionally demands every quote, everything precious in your eyes, he meant that his servants would confiscate the Torah scrolls. The scripture passage continues, verse 9. So he, so he Ahab said to Ben Hadad's messengers, Tell my lord the king, everything concerning which you sent word to your servants the first time I shall do, but the second thing, i.e. giving away the Torah scrolls, I cannot do. And the commentary says that Ben Hadad laid siege to Samaria and Ahab had no chance of defending against the invasion. The Jewish king was willing to surrender his wives, children, and wealth, but he refused to give up the Torah scrolls, even though he was a notorious idolater. For this, Ahab received the ultimate honor, the monarchy, as his reward for honoring the Torah, a reward consistent with the aforementioned mission in Abbas. So, and I'm saying this now. So imagine that. Look at this. How wicked Ahab was. And because he would not give up the Torah scrolls, he was willing to give up everything else in his household. So look at the reward he got as a, as a, as a wicked person who was an idolater. So Hashem rewarded him. So it just shows you. Okay. So now continuing on, he says, Numerous halachos are based on the obligation to honor Torah scrolls and, only, and other holy writings. The chassid will begin, build on this foundation. So now the sages of blessed memory said the following about the honor that one must accord a Torah scroll from Rambam Hilchos Sefer Torah 10.1 based on Baruchos 18a. If one was traveling from place to place with a Torah scroll, he should not place it in a bag and place that bag on the donkey and ride on it. Rather, he should place it in his bosom opposite his heart. They also prohibited, that's from Moed Katan 25a, sitting on a bed on which a Torah scroll is resting. And they similar said in a Reuven, 98a, we may not throw holy writings, even works of halacha and agada. And they prohibited, Megillah, from Megillah 27a, placing books of Nevi'im, which are the prophets, and books of Kesuvim writings on top of Chumashim. And the commentary said, 
is that proper honor of the Torah demands that one recognize that a hierarchy of holiness exists within the corpus of the holy writings and honor them accordingly. Meaning, and I'm saying this is what which one goes on top of the other. Like if you were putting if you're putting the books one on top of the other on a on a table, then you know how to do them. But better yet, if you have separate ones, like I have a Tanakh. So Tanakh is everything all together, the Torah, the Nevi'im, the Prophets, and the Kesuvim. So it's all one safer, so it's different. But uh, I would say, better yet, instead of putting them on top of each other, stand them up. <laughs> then, they, then there's no problem there. Okay, now he continues. Now these are all things that our sages of blessed memory prohibited for the entire congregation of Israel. And thus they are not examples of Hasidus. But the Hasid should extrapolate from these and add to them many similar practices for the honor of the name of Hashem, his God. And then the commentary says, some examples of going beyond the letter of the law to honor holy writings are dusting them periodically to keep them clean, storing them neatly and not haphazardly, that's from the Peleoites, Erech, Sefer, and kissing them when they fall on the ground. And it says, see Sefer Hasidim 923. Additional commentary. Even when Rabbi Cheskel Sarna was old and frail and found it difficult to walk, he would go to great lengths to make sure that the Sepharim and his yeshiva were arranged in a manner befitting them. Whenever he saw Sepharim strewn haphazardly, he would exert himself to arrange them properly. That's from Le Sichno Sidrishu, volume 1, page 232. I don't know what that is, what safer that is. Uh, okay, and then he conti- and the commentary continues. The stifler Gaon was also exemplary in his honor for Sepharim. He felt that taking a safer from the shelf and not using it was, was a slight to that safer's honor. Therefore, if he inadvertently took the wrong safer, he would spend some time studying it before returning it. When he published his works, Chaye Olam and Birchas Peretz, he at first wanted to sell them at cost, as his intention in writing them was as a public service. However, he felt that selling a safer at cost showed a lack of honor to the safer, so he decided to tell them at the, sell them, sorry, not tell them, sell them, excuse me, at a, at a slight profit and give the proceeds to Tzedakah. That's from Toldos Yaakov, page 113. So here, here's just so you know, and I'm saying this that, you have to accord honor actually to the sperm and to the scrolls themselves, not just, you know, studying them. Okay, so now he continues. If books of Torah that merely house its contents must be honored, like I just said too, then certainly the actual content must be honored. Thus, Torah must be studied in an environment that befits its holiness. Included in this obligation to honor the Torah is the cleanliness and purity that is required for studying the words of the Torah. Meaning, for example, that one should not engage in it even in thought in filthy places. And the commentary says filthy places include a bathroom or bathhouse and their close proximity as well as any area in close proximity to excrement, urine, or something else that emits a putrid odor. And then so you see, see Shulchan Aruch Archaim 85.2 and 79.8 with Mr. Brewer. Thinking, to- thinking Torah thoughts in such places is an act of extreme irreverence to which the Gemara in Brachos 24b applied the verse. The word of Hashem he has denigrated. That's from Bamidra 15.31. Conversely, refraining from such thoughts is considered an act of honoring the Torah. It is a practice of Hasidus for one who is accustomed to thinking thoughts of Torah to contemplate his finances or the like in such places to prevent even ad- inadvertent Torah thoughts. Then it says, see Sefer Hasidim 771, cited by Mishnah Brewer 85.6, and Sefer Hayira 286. So what they're saying is, and I'm saying this just to um, kind of give a, a, an, an, ex- an overview or explanation if you don't understand, extrapolation or however you want to call it <laughs> is that when you're in a place that isn't clean um and it's hard you know the Yitzhar usually does it like you're in the bathroom and you start thinking Torah thoughts start singing a b c d e f g or something like try to do something that's nonsensical or that's not related or you know start you know um i don't know if you should talk in the bathroom so maybe maybe not saying that but maybe just thinking that a b c d you know because it's really not or really shouldn't talk in the bathroom um or something else you know something that's not that you know think think about like you said your finances think about you know what you have to go shopping for tomorrow or today you know so like it gets your mind off of that okay now he continues okay uh let's see where i was um okay then he says also and not with unclean hands so it continued that sentence it was it was that <clears throat> you shouldn't engage in it even in thought and also not with unclean hands and the commentary says that hands that have a hands that have touched parts of the body that are usually covered are considered by halacha to be unclean even if there is no excrement on them it is prohibited to say words of torah until they have been washed or cleansed in some other manner that's from shulchan arachayim 92 7. 
Ramchal implies that merely thinking Torah thoughts with unclean hands is prohibited. This is in fact the opinion of the Ritva, of Ritva in Pesach, to Pesachim 46a. However, many authorities rule that mere thought is permitted in such a situation. See Shulchan Aruch Harav 1.1 and Bir Halacha 92.7. Perhaps when Ramchal writes, quote, even in thought, he refers only to, to, to the case of, quote, filthy places, not to cases of, quote, unclean hands. So he's saying, and this is me saying that just to give a better understanding, that maybe he meant actually the filthy places, but not unclean hands, meaning as far as thinking Torah thoughts. Meaning you should always, you know, or if you have water, you know, if you, they say, what do they, I think they say if you don't have, I've heard this, like you could wipe your hands on like a wall or something or, or a board or a table or something. But, um, you know, you always want to make sure your hands are clean, like they said. Okay, now Ramchal continues. Our sages of blessed memory have already exhorted us extensively about this in many places. If the Torah deserves honor, it follows that the same is true of those who study it and have internalized its teachings. So now we're talking about the people who actually study it, that they deserve honor as well. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> okay, regarding, now he continues, regarding the honor of those who study the Torah, See, the, see that a verse is written ex, explicitly obligating it in Vayikra 13, 19, excuse me, 32. In the presence of an old person, you shall rise and you shall honor the presence of a sage. And the commentary says, although zakain, which is the word for the old person um, or sage, could, could mean an elderly person here, refers to a Torah sage, regardless of his age. From, that's from Kedushan 32b. This verse not only obligates standing in the presence of a Torah sage, but also requires honoring him in other ways, such as not sitting in this place and not contradicting him. That's from Torah's Kohanim. Ramchal continues, From this we extrapolate regarding all sorts of honor that can possibly be accorded them, that it is certainly appropriate for a chassid to confer such honors on, upon a Torah sage. Our sages of blessed memory have in fact stated the following about Yehoshaphat HaMelech's treatment of Torah scholars from Makos 24a. Uh, Psalm 15 lists the 11 principles on which David Amel said that the entire Torah rests. One of them is in Tehillim 15.4, and who honors those who fear Hashem. This practice is personified by Yehoshaphat, king of Yehuda, who whenever he saw a Torah scholar rise from his seat and hug him and kiss him and say to him, my master, my master, my teacher, my teacher. We also find from Barachos 20. 8a, that the Amora of Zerah, when he became weak from his strenuous Torah st study of Torah and was unable to engage in actual study, would position himself at the entrance of the study hall in order to be able to at least perform a mitzvah when rising in the presence of a Torah scholar who would pass by. And commentary says, one who finds himself in the presence of a Torah sage must rise out of respect for him. Nothing, however, obligates a person to seek out such situations. By doing so, Rav Zera certainly went beyond the call of duty and practiced Hasidus in this area. And continuing commentary says, At advanced age and in frail health, Rav Elia Lopian made the lengthy journey from Kfar Hasidim to Yushalayim to attend the Kinesia Gadol of Agudas Yisrael in 5724, which is 1964. This was surprising since he was not identified with the organization and always avoided anything that took him away from his yeshiva. He explained that he had come so that he could rise in honor of Rav Moshe Feinstein and recite the blessing that one makes when seeing an extraordinary Torah sage. Okay, and Ramchal continues. Uh, let's see where I was. Uh, okay, so now the Chassid will expand upon all of these practices, finding additional ways to honor the Torah and the mitzvah. These are all matters that we clearly see that the Creator blessed be he desires, and he has disclosed his exalted opinion about this matter of their desirability. Being that this is so, whoever desires to bring satisfaction to his Creator will certainly embark on this path and acquire additional strategies in order to do that which is proper before him, blessed be his name. And commentary says that the Ramban to Devarim 618 notes that the Torah could not possibly spell out every detail of the proper behavior expected in interpersonal relationships. Rather, it sets down basic guidelines, such as the prohibition against Lashon Hara, revenge, and grudge bearing, the obligation to honor Torah scholars, and the like. And then adds the general admonition. Um, you shall do uh, the proper and the good in the eyes of Hashem. This first means that one should use the explicit mitzvot as guides for all types of proper behavior. From Chal's choice of words here, to do that which is proper before him, like I just read that, seems to allude to this principle, okay? And he continues, and we're almost finished for, t for this time. Now Ramchal adds one more aspect of honoring that which, that which is associated with Hashem. 
Also included in this is the obligation to honor a synagogue and a study hall. Commentary says a synagogue as well as a study hall is considered a minor base hamigdash. See Megillah 29a. Just as one honors and reveres Hashem by honoring the actual base hamigdash, see Yavamo 6a, so it is with his houses of prayer and study. Okay, Ramchal continues. For in order to honor them optimally in accordance with the principles of Hasidus, it is not sufficient to merely refrain from acting frivolously while inside of them. Commentary says, such conduct is actually prohibited from Shulchan Aruch, Archaim 151.1, and thus not a manifestation of Hasidus. What he's saying is that acting uh, fr frivolously, you can't act you know, just any way you want to inside, and that's not uh, a thing that's Hasidus. Everyone is required to, to, is prohibited from acting that way. And he continues, rather a Hasid must accord them all sorts of honor and reverence in all of his practices and all of his actions. As a general rule, anything that he would not dare do in the palace of a great king, he should not do in a synagogue or a study hall either. either. All the practices that have been described are applications of Hasidus in the manner of performing mitzvot with accompanying fear of Hashem. Specifically, these practices represent Yuras Haromimus, which is awe of his exaltedness. Okay, I'm going to stop here and I hope and pray that we all merit to live and see the coming of Mashiach speedily in our days and the rebuilding of our final and everlasting Beit HaMegdash. Amen and thanks for watching.